This is the Almost Timely Newsletter for the week of April 14th, 2024. Content authenticity statement. 100% of this week's newsletter was generated by me, the human. Uh, there's a link at the top of the newsletter that explains why this kind of disclosure is important and might be something you have to do depending on whether or not you do business in any capacity with the EU in the near future. What's on my mind this week? Generative AI needs better data, not bigger data. A lot of people have made a lot of commentary about uh, Tom Davenport's Harvard Business Review article uh, recently about generative AI and your company data. It was a pretty good article. Uh, some of those takes have been good. Uh, my co-founder and CEO, uh, Katie Robert, did a, a piece on it not too long ago in the uh, Inbox Insights newsletter. And some of the takes on it have been, you know, less less good. But let's <laughs> let's dig into a bit of the nuance behind the headline. The TLDR on the article itself, companies need to have their data in order in order to unlock its value with generative AI, and most companies are not ready. And that's 100% true. It's not a terrible surprise. We've been talking about data preparedness for, I don't know, 50 years. Uh, Davenport, who, funny enough, was actually one of my professors at Boston University many, many, many moons ago. Uh, he was my business strategy professor in the late 90s. Uh, he said in the article, for generative AI to be truly valuable to companies, they need to customize vendors' language or image models with their own data and do the internal work to prepare their data for that integration. The relatively unstructured data that generative AI uses needs to be well curated for accuracy, recency, uniqueness, and other attributes if generative AI models employing it are to be highly useful. Poor quality internal data will yield poor quality responses from gen AI models. Broadly, this is true. No objections, but there's a bit of nuance to this, a twist in this statement. The reality is that today's models, language models in particular, like those that power chat GPT, are so robust that you don't need a ton of data to make them operate well. You need enough data to evoke a response from the model that fits the situation you're using it for. Today's language models have read literally the entire public internet, plus books, code, newsletters, uh, news, YouTube, you name it. They are well-versed generalists with knowledge about well, pretty much everything. So we don't need to overwhelm them with lots of data. What we need to provide them is the right data to activate those models and have them provide precise, specific, unique results. Let's talk about a, a concrete example of this. Inside your marketing organization, you probably have a CRM, I hope. Uh, inside that CRM, you have data about your customers and their interactions with you. Do you need all that data in there to make generative AI work well for you? No. No, you do not. What you need is data about the best customers or prospects you have. And this is the linchpin there will always be very little of that data. Uh, there will always be very little of the best data. Most organizations follow a normal distribution when it comes to customers, right? You have a small number of really amazing customers. These are the ones you love. They're profitable. They're easy to work with. Um, they, they do great things. You have a big selection of okay customers, right? Not terrible, not great. They're okay. They pay the bills, Um you may have to chase them to pay them, <laughs> them pay their bills, but they pay the bills. And then a small number of really terrible customers that you try to get rid of as fast as possible, right? The normal distribution. On the marketing side, you have the same thing. You have high quality prospects, middle quality prospects, and low quality prospects. And in this case, you probably will have, well, you might have a Pareto distribution, right? Which is a power law curve. You might have in aggregate a whole bunch of, of really terrible quality prospects, all the looky-loos who are never, ever, ever going to buy anything from you and it would be a complete waste of your time to market to if you actually made a market to effort to market to them. And then you have a very small number of very high quality prospects. These are folks that uh, you're like, ah, I really need those people as, as customers. When it comes to using generative AI for things like ideal customer profile, sales copywriting, marketing copy, this, that, you know, all the, all the use cases. You don't need a ton of data, right? That's already baked into the models. You need the best data. You don't need bigger data. You need the better data. Suppose you wanted to build an ideal customer profile to use with your generative AI systems. Should you put all your customer data in? Absolutely not. No. 
you should put in just your best customer's data to create the ideal customer profile, hence why it's called ideal. And that's probably what, 10 customers at most? You could literally, in like 15 minutes, copy and paste that little amount of, of data into the consumer version of your favorite language model, like ChatGPT or Gemini or Claude, and get great results from it because the best, there isn't much of the best data. In fact, if you are too focused on the technology integration and you pour all your data into a generative model, you're going to tune it and train it on all your customers, including the ones you don't want, right? It's going to give you subpar results. It's going to give you an average. The average of all of your customers is the average customer. And when you are trying to build marketing strategy and marketing tactics and, and marketing activations, we don't want average. We want above average. We want the best customers. We want to target the best possible customers. We can't do that if we're using the data from all the customers. This, If you take the approach of let's integrate everything and pour all the data into generative AI, you're not going to get any value from it. You're going to spend years and millions of dollars on an integration that will not deliver value. Try this exercise. This is an exercise you can try at home or at work. <laughs> if, you're, if you're a B2B, if you're a B2B marketer or a B2B business, go to LinkedIn and find the profile of someone who is a decision maker at an ideal, cust an ideal customer, an ideal company, and copy the contents of that uh, profile into a text file. If you're B2C, go to the social media channel of your ideal customer, find their profile, and copy the last few dozen posts of their, their profile or maybe their, their profile page into a text file. And then B2B or B2C, with the generative AI model of your choice, have it help you build an ideal customer profile from that one person. There is a good chance that just one ideal customer's data will be enough to populate a profile that will apply to like 80% of all your ideal customers because our ideal customers all pretty much want the same thing, right? If you make left-handed smoke shifters, your ideal customer is probably somebody who grills a lot, spends a lot of money on grill accessories and things like that. And so having one exemplar of that, you're going to get a decent customer profile. Now, if you repeat that exercise four or five times, four or five different ideal customers, or, you know, your best customers, you're probably going to have 90 to 95% of the data you need for a really good ideal customer profile. You don't need all of it. You need the best of it, right? Do you need your entire enterprise's data to do that? No. And even if you had it, a lot of it wouldn't be the best data. So that is key takeaway number one. Your generative AI data strategy should be all about better, not bigger. Next, let's talk about the neural network that stores the absolute best data you could possibly have. It's a complex network that requires some very specific prompting skills and a relatively slow, inefficient way of accessing the data. But the data in this neural network is the highest quality you could possibly ask for. What neural network is this? What technology is this? It's the one between your ears. The OG neural network, the natural intelligence that begot and artificial intelligence. You and the team at your company have all the highest quality information and data you could ever want trapped inside this neural network. And all you need to do is prompt it to get the data out and into an AI tool. Here's how. Get the beverage of your choice, right? Whether it's uh, caffeinated or, or something else, you know. <laughs> Maybe if, if it's after five, get something like this. Sit down with your phone, or the voice memos app, or the AI meeting, or tra you know, a transcription app of your choice, and answer questions out loud about your current customers. You do this with a couple of people from every part of your value chain. Then you take the transcripts, merge them together, and feed it to the generative AI model of your choice. And boom, you have an ideal customer profile that's built a data straight from the humans who work with your perspective and actual customers every day. I do this all the time. When I'm thinking about you know, any kind of customer work or any kind of uh, generative work that I want to be doing, I know that the best data is in here. So I'll open my phone. I'll turn on the app and say, okay, today we're going to talk about uh, this particular technique for getting the most out of generative AI models. And I'll detail it. I'll go through it. I'll, I'll foam at the mouth for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, take the transcript, 
have a generative AI tool, condense it, summarize it, boil it down, get rid of all the extraneous stuff. And I've got great data. I've got great data that came from in here. This is the value of this neural network. And repeat, you just take this process, right? Talk to everybody on the team. Who's your favorite customer? Why are they your favorite customer? What makes them a really good customer? The CFO is going to be like, well, they pay their bills on time, right? Your VP of customer experience is going to be saying, you know, they're they're easy to work with. Your customer service reps are like, yeah, they're, they don't, they don't have, you know, yell at me <laughs> on the phone. You'll get all this information from the people that you work with. Do you need an enterprise data strategy for that? No, you need to just, just talk to people that you work with. You repeat this process with your best customers if you can, right? You spend some time with your customers. Get them the beverage of their choice. You know, here's your sparkling water or whatever. Get permission to record the conversation and ask them, what do they like about your company? What don't they like? What would they improve? What would they never want to see change? Do that with the people at your customers. Feed that into a language model, and you've got all the ingredients you need to have today's language models. Turn that into actionable, useful data. Professor Davenport is right that the time to start preparing your data for AI is now, but it's not about technology, not really. Yeah, there's all these you know, CDPs and CDOs and databases and data lakes and data warehouses and this and data fabric and all these crazy consulting terms that consultants invented just to charge more money. Those are tools. They're situationally helpful. They're situationally useful, but they are not the answer. They are not the answer to the highest quality data for generative AI. They are, at best, management mechanisms for that. The way you prepare data for AI is from the people that you interact with, the people who work at your company and the people who buy from your company and what's stored in their heads. As an aside, this is, by the way, why it's a generally poor strategy to try firing as many people as possible and replacing them with AI, which a number of companies are doing. I saw a piece on LinkedIn just yesterday. Um, this one Wall Street firm was saying, oh, yeah, we're going to get rid of all of our analysts. We're going to save so much money because analysts are expensive and the work is tedious. We're just going to have AI do it. I'm like, mm, that's a little short-sighted, not because of the technology, AI is cool. It can do amazing stuff. But inside this neural network is a vast database of knowledge that companies have largely neglected. It's, it's so funny. You know, uh, Professor Davenport used to talk all about knowledge management systems back in the 90s uh, and how expert systems and knowledge management systems were all the rage to, to leverage employee data. And here we are 30 years later and we're still talking about the same shit. And we still don't have getting data out of here and into some usable form. But we have the tools now with generative AI, with transcription, with summarization to at least get the data out in ways that's more comfortable for people. Instead of them having to key in crazy stuff to a knowledge management system, you just talk to them, talk to them, record it, and have AI work with that. If you take the strategy of we're going to get rid of all the people and just use AI, you are going to lose that knowledge in those databases. That And that knowledge is very, very volatile. Once you let someone go, the knowledge in their head, the institutional knowledge they have decays rapidly. It goes away fast. It makes total sense why, right? The moment something's not our problem anymore, like we're going to stop remembering what was important at that job and focus on what's important at the new one. And we don't care about the old company anymore. <clears throat> but the old company's like, hey, that's weird. All of our institutional knowledge is gone. No one remembers anything about this system. We have, we have a few different clients that we've worked with uh, for years now. And we have sat through the changing of the guard at those companies. And it's, the value of institutional knowledge is so underrated. It is so poorly captured at most companies, and it doesn't have to be. So this is key takeaway too. Your generative AI data strategy should be all about people, not technology. And believe me, this is weird to say as a, a self-professed nerd who loves the technology. Generative AI data strategy is not about technology. It's about people. If you're not putting people and the data they carry around in their heads first, and you're going to get very poor results from generative AI. Finally, if you focus on people, 
you're going to get less resistance to generative AI adoption. You know, everyone and their cousins reading articles saying AI is going to replace your job. Well, no. In in some cases, yes. But there is a lot of information in this database. We have been, as a profession, as marketing, we have been giving lip service to things like voice of the customer and you know, single view of the customer and listening to the customer for decades, right? Very few people, very few organizations actually do. Generative AI is a good excuse to get started with this practice, finally. And the data you gather from people will pay dividends far outside of just generative AI. But generative AI may be the linchpin for unlocking that data, right? For your employees, if you say, hey, you know what? We recognize we can't fire you all, right? We need the data that's in your neural network. And your employees will see that you value their perspective, their experience, their human relationships they have with each other and with customers. Yes, generative AI will help accelerate some of the grunt work, but it's not going to get the data out of the database. For your customers, it will show that, hey, for once in 30 years, you're actually listening to them and doing something with the data you collect to make their experiences with you better, right? If you're collecting all this customer feedback, instead of it turning into two bolts on a PowerPoint that your executives ignore, if you actually implement their feedback in generative AI systems to do things like personalization, customers will recognize, hey, look, they actually listened to me for once. Imagine that. Work with people to get the relatively small amount of the best quality data your organization and customers can provide. And you will be able to leverage the power of generative AI right away. Right away. Yes, data governance, data organization, structure, process, getting your internal data in order. That is vitally important foundational work. It needs to be done. But you don't have to wait three years, two consulting firms, and $5 million in projects to start reaping real value from generative AI today while you get your data in order. Start with the best of your data while you clean up the rest of your data. And as a shameless plug, this whole thing is literally what my company does. So if getting started with the use of generative AI and getting data out of people is of interest, hit me up. All right, <clears throat> what else happened this week? Um, you got an email from me on Friday, I think. Yes, it was Friday, about uh, the three new sheets, the the cheat sheets for generative AI. So go check your inbox if you if you market with spam, or whatever. I'll put them <clears throat> in the newsletter as well, uh, so that you can grab them. We also had uh, had a post this week on how large language models actually work, as well as the jobs that AI is going to create. I think that one is. Uh, that post is going to age real fast because there are already new, exciting things happening. But <clears throat> go watch that video or go read that post because it is important to start thinking about what jobs AI is going to create and how you can be ahead of the curve. What else happened this week? Okay, oh, jobs. Let's talk jobs. There's been a lot this week. <clears throat> uh, business intelligence senior analyst at Cox Careers, digital marketing manager at Empress, growth manager at UpVenture Media, growth marketing manager at Expression Med, marketing communications manager at Samity, marketing manager at Blue Spark Marketing, marketing manager at NICSA, marketing manager at Rumor Rose, product analyst three at Cars Commerce, product marketing manager at DD Consulting, Product Marketing Manager at Legacy Med Search, Senior Digital Marketing Data Analyst at Jack Henry, Social Media Manager at Enjoy Basketball, Social Media Manager at Writer, and Senior Digital Marketing Manager at Skin Spirit. So lots of hiring going on. Another thing's from the news. <clears throat> we had a whole, that was a real busy week this past week. We had a lot of announcements. Uh, Meta announced that Llama 3, the open source language model, is going to be coming in the next month, which um, those of us who are nerds that love to run open models on our own laptops, very exciting. Very excited to see what condition that comes out in. Google Cloud Next happened this week, and Google made a whole big pile of announcements, but I can summarize it like this. They're putting Gemini into everything they possibly can. It's here, it's in your Gmail, it's in your Google Docs, it's in your BigQuery database, it's here, it's here, it's here. It's like, oh, you know, we're, we're, if they could find a way to, to shoehorn Gemini, their language model, into a service, they're going to find a way to do it. <clears throat> that was sort of the big thing. And they're building their own chips, which was interesting. Um, it was, uh, let's see what other things happening. Oh, um, that was interesting. There's some a really good article on um, 
uh, open source and language models and stuff in Europe and how Mistral, the French company, uh, really is Europe's shining star for having uh, artificial intelligence. And this is this may be something I've put into the new in on the blog this week. Um, generative AI is like every other technology in that it can be a significant competitive advantage. And a lot of countries are trying to figure out how they can have their own domestic AI companies so that they are not reliant on the big tech companies in Silicon Valley. And so, again, if, you, if you're if not you know based in the Valley or whatever, there is this idea that everyone needs to have a generative AI play of some kind in their country or their region. And it may be a lot of opportunity for you, right? If you are skilled with the use of generative AI, there may be opportunities for you to be a part of an organization within your region that can help establish leadership, help establish a leadership force. So start looking around for that. Upcoming events. Next, I'll be in uh, Boston here for the Society for the Marketing Professional Services uh, at the end of the month, followed by the Australian Food and Grocery Council in Melbourne, then the Society for Marketing Professional Services in LA for a two-day workshop, the Marketing AI Conference in Cleveland in September, and the Marketing Profit B2B Forum in the Boston here in November. Um, there is so much going on. Uh, it's funny. I was getting ready for my, uh, starting to think through what I want to do for the Macon conference because my session uh, in theory is about open source, but there is so much happening that I may not even be able to put that talk together until like a month before at most. For example, the GPT-4 model, which powers the paid version of chat GPT, has sort of been held as, for now as the gold standard of, hey, this is the model to beat for high-performance uh, generative AI. There are now three models that are open source that you can download and run on a beefy laptop. If you've got a, a really solid gaming laptop, um, you can run these models without internet, without a data center and stuff, and that is an incredible advancement. That is unimaginable because when GPT-4 came out, it was pretty much, you know, people said, yeah, you need a room full of servers to run this thing. Now, it's the, the models have advanced so much that you can run it on, you can run it on, on a gaming laptop. That is nuts how fast the field is progressing. One last thing, uh, the Generative AI for Marketers course that we do at Trust Insights got a big update uh, yesterday. Uh, no, Friday. Um, chapters 1, 2, and 3 all got revamped. Chapter 20 on jobs got revamped. And there's still more updates to come, but uh, we, we promise to keep updating this course uh, as time goes on. And uh, the big updates were like a lot of the new tools and things. So if you have taken the course already, you can go in and get the transcripts and things from chapters 1, 2, 3, and 20 uh, just to see what's new. You don't have to rewatch them. Just download the transcripts, or you can download the audio. And if you haven't taken the course, I would encourage you to because clearly... It's being kept up to date. It's not, you know, aging into into dust as quickly as uh, you might expect, given everything happening with AI. So, that's going to do it for this week's newsletter. Thank you for tuning in, and I'll talk to you on the next one. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and if you want to know when new videos are available, hit the bell button to be notified as soon as new content is live.